Hi all, welcome Ben Cotton while he presents his talk Herding Cats, Program Management and Communities with us. We'll be starting shortly. Hi, welcome to Herding Cats, Program Management and Communities. I'm Ben Cotton, I'm the Fedora Program Manager at Red Hat. Uh, this is kind of my day job here that I'm gonna tell you about. And I just wanna be clear, this is herding cats as in getting the cats to go in the same direction, not herding cats, which is bad and you should not do. Don't hurt the cats. So uh, if you have nice things to say about the talk, you want to interact, I'm happy to talk with you about it. There's my Twitter handle. I'll be around for Q&A after the talk, etc. cetera. Uh, if you have not nice things to say, you can just keep them to yourself because nobody is harder on me than I am. All right, so let's get started. What is program management? You might be asking yourself that. Maybe it's why you came to this talk to learn a little bit about it. And I'm here to answer that as soon as I ask this question. What is project management? Similar? Different? Let's ask. So the dictionary doesn't really talk about it, but I've come up with the dictionary here for you. Projects have single focused results and a defined end. A project is over at some point. And it's really focused on producing an output. Here's a thing that we made. Isn't it nice? Okay, we're done. Programs are made, of, made up of projects. They are composed of projects, but they don't really have a defined end and they're really focused on an outcome. World domination, for example. And while Things like the Fedora project are called a project. They don't actually have a defined end. And that's just because people who don't understand the di distinction between the two uh, came up with the names. And project is a common word in open source communities like the Fedora project, the this project, the that project. And they're not really projects in this sense. And we're going to be okay with that because words are flexible and they don't have to conform to our very strict interpretation. So the question I asked, what is project management? So I asked the Project Management Institute, and it seems like the kind of thing that they would know. And they said, the application of knowledge, skills, tools, and techniques to project activities to meet the project requirements. That's not helpful. That's not helpful at all. OK, so I came up with something for you. It's basically working with project teams to balance these constraints. Time, cost, scope, quality. If you adjust one, the others are connected and they will have to adjust in some way. Uh, a lot of times time, cost, and scope are considered the iron triangle of project management. So you have this triangle and then like you tie a hot air balloon that's quality, but apparently quality wasn't in a lot of the early project management literature because I guess it was either taken as an assumed that yes, we're not gonna make crap or that they just didn't care. Um, you can look at the state of the software industry and decide for yourself. But everyone does project management. Some just do it poorly. None of the things, none of the things in this talk are going to be like particularly new. Like even if you're not thinking about project management or program management, you're probably doing the activities in some way or you're failing to do them, which is also a form of doing them. So what is program management? Well, once again, I made the mistake of asking the Project Management Institute, and they said, the application of knowledge, skills, tools, and techniques to meet program requirements. Why they took out program activities in this one, I don't know. But once again, not a helpful answer. So I answered it for you again. So basically, it's like project management. There's just more of it. And it's at a little bit of a higher level generally. So it's more about coordinating between projects and activities, sort of the intersection, the boundaries between silos or not silos, if you will. And it's less about involvement in the specific details. Like you don't necessarily care that on this day, this activity happens and on this day, this activity happens if it's all internal to one team. Basically you wanna know when does this thing affect the other parts of the program, except Turns out when your day job is this thing and you're just paying a lot of attention, volunteering yourself a lot, 
So even though my job is program manager, there are still some project manager kind of things that I do sometimes because it makes the overall program successful. And there are things that are totally outside the scope of my job that I do, like edit for Fedora magazine or update websites or all kinds of random things that I sort of pick up here and there because nobody was doing them. And now all of a sudden I'm doing them. Responsibilities accumulate without bound. All right. So what is program management, right? That's why we're here. Let's look at the constraints here. We have time. Time is about managing schedules. And managing the schedule doesn't necessarily mean you set the schedule. So if you're acting as the program manager for your, your program, your open source community, your project, you're not necessarily the one that sets the schedule, but you're sort of in charge of just knowing where we are in the schedule and knowing where we're supposed to be. And it very much does not mean being held responsible for executing the schedule because there's only so much you can do. Managing the schedules is building out the schedule, communicating it, updating it, and consulting on schedule related decisions. So I talked about, you know, things being interconnected and at uh, one point I had a conversation with Fedora Release Engineering about, oh, can we move this milestone a little bit because it always conflicts with our conference. And I said, yeah, that makes sense. Here are like four different scenarios that we could do. And one of them involves shortening, you know, the time for beta testing, one short, you know, shortened the amount of time developers had to complete their work. And it turns out there's just a lot of complexities when you move one point in the schedule because now you're affecting other things that have to be done as dependencies or as uh, downstream activities. And being the one who manages and wrangles the schedule puts you in an ideal position to be able to speak on the impacts of those things. So why would you even have a schedule? Well, users care because they might want to know when this new feature that you're working on or this bug fix that's bothering them is going to come out. They might want to time their upgrades to you know, make sure they have your latest version before they do their thing or whatever. Um, your downstreams care. So if you're you know, writing a, a programming language, the Linux distributions that package it up will probably want to know when it's going to be available, desktop environments, stuff like that. If you're, say, a community developed uh, operating system and you have a uh, corporate enterprise operating system that is built from that, they would like to know when you're going to release and when certain activities happen in your schedule. And your upstreams probably don't care, but they might. You're a major downstream for that upstream. If you're the reason that a lot of people, if that's how they interact with your software, um, they might want to make sure that they have their release in time release, especially for Linux distributions, like, you know, a desktop environment or, a, you know, major t uh, package that, you know, provides some sort of user um, interfaces or like database servers or things like that, things that people would want in their distribution. You want to be able to not have to wait till the next distribution rolls around. And there's a little bit of like, how else will you know it's done? Because software will keep adding features until it can read email and then it'll keep doing more and it'll slowly just take over the whole world. So if you have a schedule, you can be like, ah, yes, the schedule says we're done today. So there are a couple different types of schedules. These are very broad brushes here, but there is the calendar-based schedule like Fedora uses. There is a feature-based schedule, which is basically we'll release when we get this, 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 and this done. And there's sort of a, eh, it's done, I guess, uh, model, which, you know, isn't necessarily super helpful, but for small projects, especially with a development team of one, that's probably fine. It, you could do worse. So calendar based schedules to build those out, you start with the target release date and you work backwards. So if you say we want to re release on February 30th, here's all the activities we need to do to get up to a release and how long those take. And then you find out you needed to start work three months ago and you say, uh oh, you probably planned a little ahead a little better than that. So how do you pick that that target release date? Well, you might have upstream or downstream release dates that are important. So you look at those schedules and you say, all right, well, we need to have this done by then so we can incorporate that. 
where our stuff can be incorporated into that release. You might just have tradition. You know, we've always released on January 32nd. So we'll release on January 32nd this time too. You might have conferences or events that are important to the ecosystem you're in. And you'd really like to be able to get up on stage doing your keynote and talk about this great thing that you've just added and it's available, go download it now. But it has to be like available to download. So you want to have it done by then. There might be some fun dates. So like if you're developing stuff around Raspberry Pi, Pi Day is a very you know popular day because it's Pi Day. It's like right in the name, right? Or we might just say, well, you know, in eight months, we typically have something that's different enough that we feel justified in calling it a new release. So we'll just release every eight months because that sounds nice. Or we'll do it once a year because by the time a year rolls around, things will be different enough and that's a new release then. That's fine. You can also do feature-based schedules. And so with that, you start with your target feature set and you work forward. You say, here's the list of the things we want to do. How long will it take us to do that? Okay. So how do you pick the feature set? Well, how different do you want the next release to be? What justifies a new release? If you fix one bug where it's like you had a comma in the wrong place in a GUI menu, is that justify a new release? Probably not. If you've rewritten everything in a whole new language and everything's brand new from scratch, yeah, that probably justifies a new release. So then you think about how interdependent are your changes? If you change A, do you depend on B, C, and D to also get changed for things to work? All right, that should all go together. If everything's just sort of independent and modularized and microservices and all that cool stuff that the kids say these days, then you just kind of pick some because you might say, well, we don't really want to make it a calendar-based release, but we also don't want to wait seven years until our next one because you can't avoid the calendar. Sorry, even with feature-based releases, calendars still exist. And then you can have the it's done, I guess, schedules where you just wake up one morning like it's release day. I've decided. And like the the command line Twitter client that I supposedly still maintain, that's basically how releases work. I'll sit. I'll have some time. I'll sit down and get a few things done. And then I'm like, all right, well, I don't see myself doing anything for. A while. Hey, it's a release now. And that's fine if that's what works for you and works for your user community. So here's some things you want to consider about as you develop a release schedule. You want to think about what milestones you need. Are there deadlines for proposing features or having code complete? Do you have merge windows or branch days where you, you know, bring in the changes into the main trunk or you take the existing branch and you branch off this release so that you can continue doing forward development in the main branch or however you do it? Do you want to have testing windows where you basically have a freeze and you say the only thing that gets in or fixes for these bugs we find? Do you want to have certain releases like, you know, alpha and beta, or do you want to go straight to GA? How far apart should those be? Stuff like that. You want to think about conflicts. So uh, interesting quirk of the Fedora schedule is that it turns out that the mass rebuild always starts around um, for the odd numbered releases, it starts around Flock, which is our annual contrib Fedora contributor conference. And for the even numbered releases, it starts around DevConf check. That's a sort of an accident of the schedule. And it turns out that moving that things around just became a little bit of a problem for other reasons. But you want to be aware of if there are conferences that are relevant to your community that you maybe don't try and get a whole bunch of stuff done. Uh, during or right after if people are you know, traveling back as you know conferences used to be like back in the day. Uh, holidays are important to think about, but holidays are really interesting, especially when you have a mix of paid contributors and volunteer contributors. Because pa your paid contributors will often go off and do something else on holidays because they're not there to work anymore. Your volunteer contributors might actually show up and be doing more stuff because they're not at work, so they have time to work on their hobbies. Um, your paid contributors sometimes are also volunteer contributors, so they may just keep working the same no matter what happens. 
So it's interesting that when you look at like the Fedora activity, you can see a, a remarkable drop in activity the last week of December. Red Hat has a holiday shutdown and people who aren't working for Red Hat are also doing things like traveling to visit family or just spending time with family. And some people are doing stuff to escape their family, whatever. But for the most part, especially with uh, you know international communities, there's almost always a holiday somewhere going on. And so things just kind of smooth out. But you want to be sure that if there's, you know, if you have a really strong uh, contributor core in a certain region and there's a major holiday, then don't plan on having a lot of activity for that. Um, you also want to think about schedule changes. So if you move one date, others get impacted. You're either shortening a window until the next milestone, which might be important, or you're lengthening one, or you're moving up a deadline. And again, this is not a thing where you can't do that, but you want to be considerate of what that actually means for your uh, development cycle. And here's a fun one. Uh, public perception is something to consider when developing a schedule because not all one week slips are created equal. Um, the marketing and the public perception matters whether you like it or not. And so using Fedora as an example, again, um, a while back we decided that we were just gonna basically use the same cookie cutter schedule release after release because that all basically looked the same anyway. So why bother going through the whole approval process every six months when it's gonna be the same thing? Uh, but as part of that, what I did was I decided that the third Tuesday of April and October would be our target release dates because that made our alternate target uh, the fourth Tuesday. And you're like, okay, if we moved it back one week to where alternate target or, or you know initial target was the fourth Tuesday, then all of a sudden oh, that one week slip moves into May or November. And historically, Fedora has had some problems shipping on time. Um, my predecessor's last release was our first one where we you know, shipped on time and we haven't broken that since knock on wood, but, you know, we have unfairly now a reputation for being late. And so if we can slip one week and still have it be in the same month, that sounds a lot better to people and it's less public perception. That's reality folks. So what to do when your schedule is wrong? Well, if it's calendar based, you can cut your troublesome features or you can slip the release date. Uh, if it's feature based, you can, again, cut your troublesome features. And if it's mad, it's done, I guess, then the schedule is always right because it doesn't exist. And you just wake up one morning and decide it's release day. But what you say, if I was too pessimistic and I will tell you to stop lying to me because you're never too pessimistic. Um, in that case, you can release early, you can add more stuff, you can just relax, you can do more testing. Realistically, it's not a problem that comes up very often. All right, so let's talk about cost. Cost is people. Community projects don't really have a budget necessarily. Um, they don't have a lot of dollar costs. I mean, there are costs in keeping things going, but you know, it's not like you're losing out on revenue or whatever. But people, their time is valuable, whether they're doing this on their own time or somebody's paying them to do it. Like you want to respect the time they put into it. Ah, but you don't have control over the people, do you? Hmm. So your job as the program manager is to help the people coordinate and make sure that we're not running behind because we weren't talking to each other. So communication is key, and you'll see this word a lot more in the rest of the talk. But there's just so much information out there, especially in a large project, say the size of Fedora, so much going on on a variety of different mailing lists. So distilling things into highlights helps. Meetings, 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 meetings. It turns out meetings can be good. Not necessarily fun, but productive and they advance you know, work. You can do them via text 
you know, phone, video, whatever works. Think about what works for your community though, because in some places, um, people don't have the bandwidth available to, you know, to connect to a video meeting and have it be reliable. People might not be comfortable if, you know, if your project runs on English and people, you know, who are English as a second language or third or fourth, fifth, you know, non-native English speakers, they might not be comfortable with their spoken English, but they might be better written. Um, but no matter what format you use, you want to take notes. Uh, it's one thing I really like about IRC meetings is there's a bot that takes notes for me. I just give it a couple of commands and it does all its thing. It sends out an email. It's great. Uh, but you also want to make sure you have an agenda and that you stick to it. It should be clear why you're bothering to have the meeting and keeping people on track can be hard, but it's important because sometimes things will just go on forever and ever because some people like to talk. The other thing too is to, you know, don't let decisions or don't let meetings be the only place decisions get made because not everyone can attend your meeting. Some people have to work. Some people are asleep. Some people don't have the bandwidth to join. You know, decisions are best when they're made asynchronously and you want to make your synchronous meetings um, as accessible as possible to your community. But you don't want to shut people out of the decision making process because they can't join the meeting. So speaking of channels, um, I'm a really big fan of having one asynchronous tool and one synchronous tool. So a synchronous tool like a chat like uh, IRC or Telegram or whatever chat system you want to use. And then one asynchronous tool. So a mailing list or a discussion forum, but not both. Because you really don't want to be splitting the conversation. Well, we talked about that in Telegram and that in IRC and that on Matrix. And that was on the mailing list, but that was in the discussion forum. It's hard to keep up. And yeah, you can bridge those things together. And maybe that's a solution for your uh, for your community, but really having a single place say, this is where we communicate is uh, going to make life easier for people. You want to keep the barrier to entry low, no matter what tool you use. It's good to have archives. Those are usually your friend. There are times when you need to have private conversations that aren't archived, but the, the default should be, we're logging this and it's going to be available later. Because not only is that helpful for people who want to learn more about your community to see how it works or to, you know, people who are going to write news articles about your releases or something that can see what's going on. But it's also really helpful to you because I can't, I've lost track of the number of times I've had to go back and look at an email thread from six months ago and be like, oh yeah, that's why we decided to do that. Okay, I can do this then. The other thing that's really important, I talked about there being a lot of information out there. So moderating a channel for important messages is important. You want something where the assumption is everyone's going to subscribe to this. And if it comes out on this channel, we expect you to read it. The, the other side of that coin is only the really important stuff is going to get through here. And it's going to be low volume. Uh, so for Fedora, we have a development mailing list where lots of discussion happens on a variety of things. Then we have an announced mailing list where every message has to be approved. So accidental replies, those go away. Basically, only things that are like big, important announcements, you must pay attention to this, goes through there. And that allows people who don't want the deluge of all the messages to still, still see the important announcements. So let's talk about scope. And scope is really like managing your changes or your features or whatever you want to call them. I'm going to use the word change here mostly because that's the process we have in Fedora. We used to have a features process, the changes process, replace that. It's better. I've given a talk about that. Talk to me about it later. So why have it? Communication, receiving feedback, and then more communication. Like I said, this word comes up a lot. Now the process is going to vary by the size. And when I say size here, I'm not talking about lines of code. That's the number of contributors who are participating. So you want the weight to be proportional to the size um, because what happens is the number of communication channels, the connections between individuals is exponentially related to the number of people. Doubling the size of a group more than doubles the amount of communication lines between them. 
So if you look at this graph, you have really big project with a relatively heavyweight process like Fedora's. My command line Twitter client has an effective development community of zero, but really, but one. And so it has a very lightweight process, which is basically Ben did a thing. Okay. Your project probably fits somewhere along that axis. And so you, when you think about it, think about what's appropriate for your community, for the, the volume of people and the work you're doing. So if you're developing this kind of process, what do you want to think about? Um, who should validate the change? Check it out to make sure it's reasonable. Does release engineering be like, yep, we can do this. Do you have a legal person who's like, yep, that license is good. Nope, we can't do that. We're going to get sued. Do you put it in front of the community for a general review? Who defines what the community is? How do they review it? And then separately, and this, is, this is important, who approves the change? Because people can have input without actually being allowed to vote on it. So you could put it up to a community vote where everyone gets to say yes or no, and you take a majority vote, or you have two thirds majority, or whatever. You can have some sort of technical steering body who is a small group of people that makes these kinds of decisions. You can have a single project leader who you know speaks with authority on all things and they decide on their own what goes in and what stays out. So my opinion, and again, this is probably colored by this being what Fedora does, um, democracy is really messy. We may have learned over the years. Um, and some people will only show up to complain, but then not actually make contributions to your community. And maybe that's okay with you, maybe it's not. Um, but if you wanna get decisions made in a reasonable-ish timeframe, having an elected technical body to approve the changes is a good approach. Uh, assuming your project is you know, big enough to justify it. If, you're, if there's three of you, you, two, you three can argue it out. If there's 300, you might want to have a few people who get elected every few months or every year or whatever, and they are the ones that votes on things because then you still, and the elected part's important because that still gives the community a vote. It becomes a representative democracy instead of just a straight democracy. And if people don't, if your community doesn't like the direction that the technical body is taking it, they can vote them out. You don't have to do it this way. This is my opinion. Again, so some considerations you want to think about here is what happens if changes conflict. If you and I both say, I want to do this thing, but these things are mutually exclusive, who decides what goes forward or how that gets resolved? What happens if I make a change and it breaks something, which would never happen, but if it did, you know, who decides what to do about it? Who has the authority to back it out? And what happens if changes are undelivered? If I said, yep, I'm going to do this thing, and then I go off to the beach and disappear and never actually do it. Quality. Tests are good. It's good to have tests, preferably automated, because that people are expensive. We went back to, you know, people have costs. Um, but, you know, manual testing is important for some things and whatever. But more than that, you want to have some release criteria. You want to have, you know, we must be able to do this, this, and this, and this thing may not happen in order to release it. So you may have a criteria that says when the user upgrades, it will not remove all the data on their system and turn their computer into a giant molten pile of metal. People will appreciate that. And having release criteria can be helpful for um, building trust with your users because they know that you've done at least some degree of validation. But it's also important to consider that not every bug can block the release because otherwise you will never release. So you do want to have some way to sort of triage these important but not enough important enough to block bugs and maybe prioritize getting those fixed first after the release. All right, so how do you do all this program management stuff that I've been talking about? And there's a lot more that isn't covered because I only have so much time to cover a whole lot of different things. But for the time being, how do we do this? Communicate, communicate, communicate. That's the core of my job. I send email, I receive email, I publish blog posts, I review blog posts, I attend meetings. Um, 
one of the first things I did when I uh, became the Fedora program manager was I made a list of all the meetings that are going on and tried to make it to almost all of them at least once, just to wave my hand, say, hi, hey, I'm here. I'm paying attention. I know you exist. Come to me if you need help. And I am on a lot of mailing lists where I don't actually have any intention of ever doing anything in that part of the community just because there's only so much I can do or I just don't have the skills for that. But it's still important for me to know what's going on and to be able to spot issues and try and help people out. So there's a lot of listening that goes in. There's also a lot of talking outward communication. Um, so I do a weekly blog post where I say, here's all the stuff that's happened this week at sort of a high level. You know, here are the changes that were submitted and here are some upcoming important meetings and conference deadlines and the scheduled milestones and all that stuff. Uh, I have regular office hours, which people almost never attend, but that's okay because sometimes they do and we talk about things and the rest of the time, I'm there if they need me, but it's important to be available and visible to the community. And then also public issue trackers or Kanban boards or something so that people can see what you're working on and they have a way of letting you know, hey, something's broken, I need help with this thing or whatever. So most of the things I've talked about here are just program management in general, whether it's corporate programs or community programs. So how is it different in communities? Well, like in companies, people don't really appreciate process and bureaucracy for the most part. They want us to be able to do their stuff and not have to worry about making sure they checked all the boxes and did the things and blah, blah, blah. Also, like in companies, you might not have any direct authority over the people who are working on stuff. And the job is really all about communication and coordination. So here's what's different. In communities, you can really only lead by influence. So it took me about six months before I was comfortable saying, no, go, go redo that because that's not what you need to do for this process. Before that, I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll, help. I'll fix that up for you before I send it along, it's fine. And that's because it takes time to build credibility. And even though I'd been a contributor to Fedora for a long time, I was sort of off on the side a lot. I wasn't necessarily very visible and people aren't going to listen to you just because you have a title. You need to establish that, yes, you know what you're talking about and you're going to be helpful and you're here to make things better. You have to show the community your value because you can't go complain to somebody's manager when they're not doing the thing because there's not a manager for them to complain to because they're doing this in their spare time. So the most important thing to remember, if you take away nothing else, is that whatever process you develop, the process is here to serve the community. The community is not here to serve the process. And if you find yourself trying to adjust the community to serve your process, that means your process is wrong. And so with that, we are out of time. So I will stick around for your questions and I appreciate your attention. Once again, if you have nice things to say, there's my Twitter handle. If you have not nice things to say, you are cordially invited to keep those to yourself. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ben, for an amazing presentation. And now we would like to have some questions if there are any. And if you have a question and don't feel like typing, uh, feel free to request to join with audio and video. So Neil asked, what was the hardest thing for you when you started being a program manager? Um, I think for me, it was knowing all the connections. Uh, you know, Fedora is a huge community. Uh, a lot of people have been around for a long time. And, you know, so even though I'd been contributing and there were a lot of names I'd recognize over the 10 ish years that I had been a volunteer, um, there were a lot of parts of the project that I just hadn't touched yet. 
And so learning all those connections and trying to understand them and, you know, insert myself where appropriate without getting in the way was really hard. Uh, Karsten asked, do you network with other program managers who work on other open source projects, both inside and outside of Red Hat? So I, uh, from an HR perspective, I'm on the team uh, at Red Hat that does all of the program management for uh, RHEL uh, specifically. So not any of the things layered on top of it, but just the various Red Hat Enterprise Linux distributions. One of the things I've really wanted to do um, and I just haven't done yet because it's a big undertaking and there's only so much time in the day is to sort of put together uh, an informal group of people who are um, you know, doing similar roles in other uh, community driven uh, operating system distributions or other you know, very large projects and sort of build a community of practice, I guess, around that. Um, because there are a lot of things I think we can learn from each other. Um, but if there is one of those, it's very secretive and hard to find. So um, I would have to start it or talk somebody else into starting it. Um, but I think, you know, like I said in the talk, even if you don't have the program manager title, and even if the functions aren't done by one person, the work is being done somewhere in the project. So it's, uh, it, you know, it's good to build that knowledge, especially for people who don't have the benefit of you know, having sort of a formalized role. Um, I think there's a lot of things that you just sort of start doing because you realize it needs doing, but you don't get the benefit of, um, you know, the interaction and some of the historical knowledge that gets handed down uh, from like, for example, from my predecessors. Yes, uh, definitely be happy to talk to you later about bringing that into the open source way. Or talking to you about it now if there are no other questions. <laughs> Hi, friend. Hi there. Wow, apparently I can just make myself join. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, that, just to, if I don't want to take over for you know, other things, but but I hadn't even thought about this necessarily until you said it. And, and I was like, oh, yes, that's a, that's community of practice stuff. And I don't know. Um, I do. We have other people we know. I mean, um, um, Amy Scavarda comes to mind right away, who's an you know, experienced program manager in another organization. There's a lot of people out there doing very similar um, kinds of things. So. I don't know if we'd be happy to facilitate that or probably make it flow. Wow, Jesus Christ. Hi, Neil. <laughs> hey, Neil. Yeah, I think that'd be good because, <laughs> like, you know, I, certainly okay. in it a little. my role, and I think fairly broadly across Red Hat, I am maybe the only person whose full time job is being a program manager in an upstream community. Uh, you know, we de we have people working in like community architect roles who, you know, they do some of this work and we have people involved in other upstreams in different ways, but I don't know that we've formalized any other upstream role like this anywhere in the projects that Red Hat's involved with. So I was actually so just about to unique. ask about that because, you know, you know, my experience operating in so many different communities is that I think you're actually one of a kind. Um, yeah. Like, uh, so for those who may not know, I actually operate in lots of Linux uh, and operating system communities. And Ben's particular role is unique to, to the governance of Fedora because in other Linux distribution communities, even large semi-corporate backed ones or fully corporate backed ones, there isn't an equivalent position held by anybody. In OpenSUSE, community manager, project owner, and uh, and director, whatever you want to call it, like these all these little functions that that in Fedora are split up across four different people, one person, 
And then there's in Ubuntu, where they have the community council thing, which has been, um, I don't know if you saw it recent news, uh, it, it's not much of one at the moment, but hopefully it will be again. But like that was an all volunteer position that operated um, that function of the of of the Ubuntu community and Debian being a um, essentially owned by a charity, right? SPI owns them. That's how they operate. They don't have, and their culture does not permit them to have such a role at all. They don't have a way for people to coordinate at scale in the same way that you do. But what is interesting, though, is that you're right. People who don't necessarily have that title wind up doing it anyway, right? It just shows mm -hmm. up because it kind of needs to be done. So I wonder, one thing that I wanted to ask, and it just didn't, it was too slow to type, was have you tried reaching out to the other community to see who those people are and to see what is similar and what is different between the formal program manager and the informal like it kind of just happened program manager type not really that's you know that's kind of part of what i what i was talking about like wanting to do is you know seeing what other communities are doing and how they do it um i've talked to lubosh a little bit at open susa um and like we've compared notes on a few th things a few times but you know there's not really like a like I'd love to start a mailing list of you know people who do these sorts of things and just you know get together every once in a while and and talk about the things we do in our jobs. Um, but it, it's kind of hard. It can be hard, especially from outside the community, to try and figure out who are the people in that community doing the job, especially um, when it's split across you know three or four different people doing the same thing that that I'm doing. Right. But, at the, but at the least, if you start gathering practices together and start gathering people who are doing parts of those jobs, this is just because that's kind of, yeah, that's what happens with open source where people take on, take on multiple roles. Well, um, and to some degrees, you might, because I remember how this world, world started in Fedora. It started because somebody started to pull the practice together and was doing the job sort of not exactly formally, but wanted to get to that, wanted to kind of un, untangle those bits from the pro, from the pro, uh, project lead who was having to do all that stuff too and then mm -hmm. in that untangling to find a role for themselves that move forward and so this is other people can do this if we give the people those untanglings to some degree so and i see there's a question from david in chat though so yes that's true too yeah. i see there's a question from david in chat i don't want us to take over from so he said um he said he finds one of the big issues that come up here is that of not having influence in places where you have responsibility how do you identify and track that in a way that makes sense that's a hard one. Um, you know, I, influence. There are places I don't have influence, and you know, I try. Um, sometimes you just have to be very patient over months or years to build that. A lot of it is volunteering to do things that you hate doing because somebody else hates it, and like you know what, I'll take this work off your plate for a little bit, and you can focus on that other thing. Um, and you know, it's it's very much like an exchange of favors kind of thing. Um, you know, I think a good program manager is always owed a few debts by everyone um, because then you can call those in at some point. Um, and you know, some of it is just being. Sometimes you have to stand up and assert yourself, even if you know you're going to get ignored. Uh, and then you go back and say, you know. I did it. I did what I could. Um, it is helpful within, you know, within Fedora that there are a lot of people who work at Red Hat um, and are working on Fedora, at least in part on their day job, because those, like in those cases, I can escalate things to managers, especially when it's, you know, release criticals. I can go to them and say, hey, I need help. And it's not, it's very rarely a, hey, your person is a screw up. It's more of a, hey, this is a, big priority can you re reallocate their time a little bit for another week or two um, and you know one thing that my manager made very clear during the interview process and when I first got, came on board was I'm not going to be held responsible for the timing of Fedora releases because like I could do my job poorly and things will kind of fall apart a little bit like we'll still manage but it maybe maybe won't run as smooth but there's nothing that I can do if everything else is falling, like I cannot fix, you know, the the process uh, like more generally, um, and so 
um, I think sometimes you have to be willing to accept that you've done your best and everything still went wrong. Um, and it looks like uh, we're closing in a, f a few minutes. So... Um, yeah, you can go for a few minutes more if you want. Okay. Okay. Uh, are there other questions? And if you want to continue the conversation, we also have breakout rooms under the Expo tab. I just linked it in the chat. So feel free to head there after. All right. Looks like there's no more questions for you, Ben. Thank you so much for that talk. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.